Hey y'all, welcome and thing, you know, and we're talking about slavery again, but this time we're going to talk about why did Britain abolish slavery, you know what I mean? And uh, so I'm going to react to this one here too for you guys and thing, you know, see what the, the, the root cause of it. And the others, uh, and the other ones, we, 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 we talked about it, but you know, didn't delve into the actual deep dive into the reasons why. So this is probably a perspective, a different perspective, or, you know, it could be the same perspective, but more in depth. So let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see why Britain abolished the slave trade. All right, okay, this is gonna be interesting, y'all. Stick around, let's check this out. On the 25th of March, 1807, Britain officially abolished its slave trade. This signaled the termination of a commerce that had seen close to 13 million Africans transported inhumanely aboard slave vessels across the Atlantic to a brutal and degrading plantation system in the Americas with up to 2 million slaves not even having survived the voyage. It would be an understatement to say that achieving this had been an overwhelmingly difficult task. The trade had generated vast wealth, not only for the proprietors across the Atlantic, but also those thousands of merchants, bankers, shipbuilders, insurers and investors in Britain who claimed a financial stake in the trade. Not to mention, the British Treasury itself. It had taken a combination of an utter dedication to the cause of religion and morality, a new innovative public campaign that captured the imagination of the British public, a new pragmatic strategy utilised by anti-slavery MPs in Parliament, and a series of fortunate or unfortunate events, depending on which way you look at it, for abolitionists to eventually end the inhumane traffic of Africans across the Atlantic. Well, the Abolition Act of 1807, of course, comes a full 20 years after they started their campaign in the late 1780s. So that tells you something already, I think, about how difficult it was to, to get that bill passed. Despite its popular appeal, despite all of the uh, weight of public opinion that appears to have been behind the abolition of the slave trade, there were very powerful people in powerful positions who wanted to oppose it. Yet for all of those who had fought so hard to see the slave trade abolished, there was this looming sense of unfinished business, that their ultimate aim had not been achieved. And that, of course, was the emancipation of the entire enslaved population in the Americas. But in order to do this, abolitionists would have to overcome numerous hurdles. Even with public opinion on their side, they still faced a fierce pro-slavery lobby in Parliament. The West India interest, determined to uphold an institution they were so heavily invested in, and that still benefited Britain financially. Lots of the opposition is very, very similar. So the slaveholders, the sugar planters, who opposed the abolition of the slave trade because they argued that it would be a fundamental problem for their business, uh, though, those sorts of voices are, are there in the campaign against slavery itself when that really picks up pace in the 1820s. Uh, many planters arguing that an abolition to, of slavery, although some of them say it might be desirable in the distant long term, is not feasible in the short term because of the economic consequences that they claim it, that it would cause. Isn't that crazy how... <laughs> and, and we still do it to today. It's, it's probably never going to change, you know, how uh, people put money and material things before human beings. And you could see that throughout history. I mean, a same race do it to same race, same country do it to same, uh, consider their own citizens. 
You know what I mean? Even family members do it to family members. Uh, if it's money and if money is involved, you know what I mean? And it's it's crazy how it seems like they're trying to spin it like and I'm assuming they spin it this way to tell poor people who probably were for the emancipation that it's gonna hurt their bank accounts, it's gonna help their money, it's gonna help their job situation. It's gonna uh, not help but hurt sorry, hurt their job situation if they stop the slave trade. Uh, you know what I mean? And sometimes it would convince them. And it's the same type of strategies we see in today. You know what I mean? If we give these people equal rights, it's going to hurt you. It's going to take away from you. You know, these people want rights of this and right to work or equal work conditions. That's going to take away from you. The, that's a political spin you hear because, you know, like, okay, here they have this uh, EBT card food stamps and some poor people get it. But, you know, other poor people complaining that those other poor people get it because they, they have it so, they have them believing that these people are lazy and not that they can't find work when there's not that much work to find. And if you do find work, and this is a problem right now, if you do find work, it's, you don't get... The, 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 the corporations don't give you enough hours so that you could pay your bills. So you still have to get the, the, the food stamps or the EBT card. You still have to get that government subsidies to survive. And then you get blamed for having to do that. You get looked upon for having to do that, even though you're working. Even though they're cutting hours. So it's, it's sort of the same thing. So it, it is a kind of a slavery now because you're working and you still can't pay your bills. You're struggling from paycheck to paycheck. And there's a stress and stuff like that. Let's get back to this here. The stance of the West India lobby was clear from the outset. To abolish the slave trade was one thing and hugely damaging in itself. But to end slavery would be to utterly ruin the West India colonies which had once been the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Moreover, it would utterly destroy the livelihoods of all that had been encouraged to invest in the institution, both abroad and at home in the metropole. It is with this in mind, and with the help of Krista Petley, Professor of Atlantic and British Caribbean Studies at the University of Southampton, that I will attempt to understand just how little over a quarter of a century after the slave trade had been abolished, abolitionists were able to see an Emancipation Bill ratified in Parliament on the 28th of August 1833, liberating all those bound in chains and effectively decimating the established plantation industry. This is the story of the year Britain abolished slavery. January 1808, British ships were now banned from carrying on the slave trade and British colonists in the West Indies were forbidden from importing new slaves from Africa. Now I'm here at Canary Wharf, what used to be the West India docks, a central hub of commercial slave trading activity, as you can see from the uh, sugar warehouses that still stand to this day behind me. Wow. Now you may think places like the West India Docks would have suffered immensely or even ceased to exist after 1807. After all, no slave trade surely meant no commerce. But the reality couldn't have been more different. Business boomed at the West India Docks, even after 1807. Sugar, rum and coffee imports all increased dramatically. In fact, the number of ships discharged in the docks rose from 350 in 1804 to an early peak of over 640 ships in 1810. The company was flush with money. Profits beyond the dividend limit amounted to over £800,000 by 1818, roughly £70 million in today's money. What abolitionists knew, but many Britons failed to consider, was that the abolition of the slave trade 
had actually made precious little difference to the 700,000 men, women and children who remained in bondage in the West Indies. On the 25th of March 1807, they still rose at the crack of dawn and worked tirelessly in the sugarcane fields and boiling houses and continued to feel the excruciating pain of the whip. abolitionists wanted to end slavery and even Prime Minister William Grenville when he introduced the 1807 Act to Parliament suggested at the end of his speech that an eventual end to slavery might come about but the initial decision of abolitionists, a strategic one that they made at the beginning of their campaign was that the uh, weakest part of the Atlantic slave system and the one that was easiest for them at that time to criticise was the slave trade because it was so horrific. The whole system is horrific but that particular part of it, the, the trafficking of human beings in, as cargo across the Atlantic was the bit that they knew they would be able to oppose. And so for abolitionists there truly was a sense of unfinished business. As Wilberforce admitted, those who had longed to see the slave trade abolished had always relied upon abolition in 1807 to ultimately pave the way for emancipation. So many more conservative-minded people thought that 1807 might be the only piece of parliamentary legislation that was necessary. But of course, there are more radical people, more radical abolitionists in Britain, and of course, the slaves themselves in the Caribbean colonies, who wanted much more than just an abolition to the slave trade. They wanted the end of slavery itself. So I think what you see in 1807 is a really important piece of legislation, but by no means the end of the struggle, and certainly by no means the end to the debate. Now, I think it's really important to consider when looking at sources such as you know, it's kind of crazy that we have to come to the point where we have to sit down and debate the pros and cons of treating people like humans. That's kind of sad, ain't it? And it's still happening today. We see it in everyday politics. You got these people debating people's faith. And then they fight and fight and fight and especially here nothing ever gets fixed, nothing ever gets taken care of. They just recycle the same argument every year. With the abolition of state trade and stuff like that, it seems but you know, if if the ordinary people wasn't behind it, it probably would not have gone through. You know what I'm saying? Seems like the populace was behind the whole abolition of the slave trade, and it was just the rich people that were fighting to keep it because they were worried about their pockets. You know what I'm saying? Does William Wilberforce's appeal a key document? when contemplating the Emancipation Bill in 1833, then we focus on this date of publication, 1823. Wilberforce 
white and black formed 16 years after the abolition of the slave trade, the same year in which the Anti-Slavery Society was formed. And whilst that clearly is no coincidence, as we have just witnessed, Wilberforce's writing seems to be more of a reflection on and a justification of the inaction between 1807 and 1823. In reality, no substantial legislation had been achieved by abolitionists up until this point, apart from perhaps the 1816 Slave Registry Bill. And I think it's this reason that makes Wilberforce put pen to paper. So one of the things that happened after 1807 was a sense that the abolition bill might start to have an effect on slavery in the Caribbean. And abolitionists do want to see what that effect might be, whether it will lead to rapid improvements in conditions and perhaps help to set the the, the road, the, the things in progress for an end to slavery itself. Um, and it's when they realise that that's not happening in the early 1820s that they begin to put together another nationwide campaign focused this time on ending the institution itself. So they just threw them some crumbs there. We abolish it. Number 25 poultry is an address right. that no longer exists. But for years, it was home to a story tavern, the King's Head, what is now a hotel. Now, by 1823, evidently enough time had passed before previous members of the original abolition society, that is the society for effecting the abolition of the slave trade, members such as William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson came together again to form a new society. The new organisation was, however, in desperate need of new blood. Many of the loudest voices against slavery in the late 18th century had passed away, and both Wilberforce and Clarkson were both suffering from poor eyesight and ill health. In fact, Wilberforce wore a steel corset to keep himself upright. With a heavy heart, he would leave this fight to the younger men, men such as Thomas Fowle Buxton. Born into a family of Quakers, Thomas Buxton had been inspired by those closest to him to serve the anti-slavery cause. A tall and physically commanding man nicknamed the Elephant, Buxton became the obvious choice to take the reins from Wilberforce and succeed him as the anti-slavery figurehead in Parliament. Now to fully understand why an Politics, anti -slavery boy. society was formed in 1823, it is important to consider what abolitionists were hoping to achieve with the 1807 Slave Trade Act. It was hoped by abolishing the slave traffic, conditions for slaves in the West Indies would naturally improve. The logic behind this reasoning was if slave owners were no longer able to purchase slaves from abroad, they would be incentivized to treat their workforces better. Force was referring to in his appeal when he stated that abolitionists had deceived themselves by expecting much more benefit to the plantation slaves from the abolition of the slave trade than has actually resulted from that measure. They truly believed that proprietors would take the necessary measures and at the very least maintain populations on their estates. But this was clearly not the case. The figures were there in black and white Slave populations in the Caribbean colonies were in decline, so much so that plantation owners openly complained that they did not have sufficient labour forces anymore. The qualms Wilberforce raised in his appeal wow. were not limited to slave population decreases. He claimed that slaves were practically strangers to Christianity and criticised the use of the whip and other methods of torture and extreme punishment. These claims were also bolstered by the various testimonies of missionaries and former slaves who had witnessed firsthand the extreme degradation of the enslaved populations for themselves. One such man was Olauda Equiano, one of the most influential abolitionists of his generation. A former slave who had purchased his freedom and travelled to Britain published his autobiography in 1789 which documented his kidnap from Africa, his voyage across the Atlantic, and the brutality he witnessed during his life in slavery. It was very common for slaves to be branded with the initial letters of their master's name, and a load of heavy iron hooks hung around their necks. Indeed, on the most trifling occasions, they were loaded with chains, and often 
other instruments of torture were added. The iron muzzle, thumb screws and such are so well known as to not need a description and were sometimes applied for the slightest fault. I have seen a negro beat until his bones were broken for only letting the pot boil over. But in reality... I'm telling you man, that these days there's a group of people who like I'm gonna say straight up the government the the governor of uh Florida said that uh slavery was good to 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 the slaves because they learned trades so that they could uh, they they could continue but look at the torture that uh, this former uh, slave is is stating that they went through so how how cool is that possibly how does that possibly be good if you're beating them until they die and And I, I, I've seen some politicians here say that black people were better on the slave trade because at least they had a house and they had some land and they had a family type structure. But if we equate it to today's sort of living, and I'm not trying to dilute the share horror that was happening back then, but just to bring it, break it down, uh, you know, better. We work so much, we don't really have time to raise family because we get home, we're so tired, we gotta have a rest to get up the next day to go do it all over again. So imagine how it is with the, with the slaves, you know, they, 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 they work in that hot sun all day, they get whipped, they get beaten, then they come home. They're pretty much licking their wounds, they're not doing the family thing. Some may, but you know, if you come home and you have, well, you know, your back is all busted up, you're gonna need nursing. You know what I'm saying? So, when they say that they they were better off then and they had a family structure, they really didn't because the conditions w wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Evidence of the high mortality rates and population decreases in the colonies were of the highest value to the anti-slavery society, especially in the House of Commons. Members of Parliament were not as sympathetic as the general public to the testimonies of former slaves and missionaries, which were often mistrusted or countered by reports from the colonial assemblies and planters themselves. These stark figures, however, could not be refuted. That's kind of exactly what's happening today. You have these people who experience the the the, 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 the horror of the slave trade and, and you know and seeing for themselves, and they're trying to tell these people what are happening, and they are going, well, you know, they're probably exaggerating, you know. They, it's the same mentality that you know, we have today to a certain degree. When 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 you try to tell somebody that you, you experience racism, they say, well, you know, it's, it's probably not that bad. You're probably just calling wolf, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? I'll tell you a story. My, uh, I remember driving down the street one day up here. Uh, my ex-wife, we were driving down the street, okay? And uh, there was a couple of black young men whose car broke down. And uh, I saw a cop coming up. They had the door open, you know, and they were running back and forth trying to get the car started. And uh, she said, uh, oh, look, there's a cop. He's going to help them. I said, he's not going to help them. He's going to go yell at them. <laughs> and he did. Boy, get your car out of the way. It's broken down, so what? move it. And he's just yelling and screaming. And she's like, whoa. I said, yeah, you know, that stuff happens. Now, granted, this was a while back. This was about, what, 10, 10 or so more years ago. But, you know, it's kind of the same thing, you know. They come to you and they say, this is what's happening. But it's kind of different because for them, they were trying to protect their money, trying to protect their material things. I don't know what these, these what people are trying to protect now because we're all in the same boat. Pretty much, we work paycheck to paycheck. And when, whenever people that are in the same circumstances as we are, as everybody else, I should say, not as we are, but 
and they, they they push it back they're not realizing that you know there's a a struggle going on and we're all in it you know what i'm saying and so they had the statistics they had the testimony and no one could doubt that they had the moral high ground at this point but members of the anti-slavery society knew the mammoth task that lay ahead were they to see an emancipation bill voted through in parliament the world inside the house of commons was an isolated hostile den where as historian michael taylor has noted there was no such thing as left or right it was all about connections and interests the most powerful and influential of course being the west india lobby the abolitionists knew that by proposing the end of slavery they had effectively declared war on one of the most powerful political groups in British history. So there are MPs sitting in Parliament throughout the whole of this period who are slaveholders, who are absentees, uh, that is to say people who own property in the West Indies, usually sugar planters, but sometimes also merchants um, who own slaves in the Caribbean, um, but who have remove themselves to Britain, uh, wealthy enough to do that, and uh, become elected to Parliament. And they, they form part of this bigger West India interest. And although that group is declining somewhat after the Napoleonic Wars, they remain a really influential pressure group. So one thing that abolitionists are up against is a really well-equipped and um, seasoned group of political lobbyists who are arguing in favor of the slaveholders see and, and these days everybody's like you know we need a good businessman to be president and run the country but who do you think they're going to look out for history tells you who they're going to look out for history tells you who they're going to look out for they're not going to go in there and say okay let's do this ways the minimum wage or anything like that so in essence, politics is just what was uh, maintaining the, 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 the idea that slavery is needed. These people got voted in. And it's kind of like the same thing because who voted them in but poor people if that's the way the system works. Here poor people vote them in, they do what they want, they get rich and then they move on. They make promises, never keep it. Promises to the people, but they kept the promises to themselves. It's crazy. Repeating itself, huh? One of the abolitionists' fiercest critics who directly challenged Wilberforce's appeal was a man named George Wilson Bridges. Bridges was an Anglican clergyman who had married into a family of the planter elite in Jamaica. He had travelled to the colony in 1816. And I apologise for that noise. I don't know what's going on. I've been hearing sirens in this place for at least two or three times a day. I've never heard this many sirens in this place. That's like the third time today. I know there was a, a storm go through, but I, there wasn't anything here. and I don't know what's going on at the invitation of the governor and had soon become rector for the parish of St. Anne. Bridges was a well-known and well-read critic of the anti-slavery campaign and directly challenged Wilberforce's assertions in a book entitled A Voice from Jamaica. He claimed that Wilberforce, having not been to the colonies, knew little of the actual state of slaves, a common argument used by proprietors across the Atlantic and in the Commons, and that Wilberforce completely disregarded the efforts that had already been made by Anglican clerics and plantation owners to improve the conditions of the enslaved population and raise them to the rank which all Christians should be. <laughs> the arguments came thick and fast. Bridges claimed that Wilberforce's slave population figures were completely wrong, that he was mentally deluded, and that he cared more about the black population in the West Indies than the poor, suffering labourers in Britain. It was all fake news, he claimed, and people would soon see through the wretched artifices 
the main argument that's presented against abolitionists is that they deal in theory, that they are armchair philanthropists, and that it's really the slaveholders themselves, that's how the slaveholders present it, that know the situation on the ground in the West Indies, and that the abolitionists are these distant do-gooders who don't really understand the practicalities of things. And so you see all sorts of caricatures of them uh, preaching and telling the most lurid tales about the abuses that enslaved people are enduring in the West Indies, that the slaveholders argued did not bear any um, similarity to, to the reality. Bridges effectively channeled all the frustrations of the planter class in his publication. The Anglican vicar, like those in the West India interest, questioned Wilberforce's integrity and motivations. To degrade the white population and to ruin many thousands of his countrymen was treacherous enough. But there was no doubt that the noble cause Wilberforce claimed to support was all a facade. He and those in the anti-slavery society held their own vested interests in seeing slavery abolished. Doubtless you expect that by agitating the subject at the present moment you will ensure the venal support of the East Indian interest which seeks to overwhelm these western sugar colonies as a matter of mere mercantile speculation. They try to discredit them. They try to say that all you're interested in is something that you've never really had to witness or understand for yourself. The difficulty with that, of course, is that abolitionists frequently were on really strong ground when they talked about slavery, um, including the sorts of evidence that missionaries were able to bring back from the Caribbean, having worked with enslaved people in the Caribbean, having witnessed at first hand some of the brutalities of the system. So abolitionists were very well informed on the whole, but a key pro-slavery argument went that they were not and tried to pull the rug from under their argument in that kind of way. Plus all of these arguments as well about abolitionists somehow being more than just these um, moral crusaders. There were arguments, for example, that they were in the pocket of the East India interest. Oh. And the reason that they were going after slavery in the West Indies was try to try to boost the, the sugar trade in the East. Uh, you see, that's kind of like the whole communist uh, argument that they're doing now, you know what I mean? If you ain't uh, for this, then you must be a communist. You want to get, take God out of the, 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 the schools and the churches and, and you want us to stop, you know. So it's that's kind of the same argument, sort of, you know. Uh, only they weren't really using religion there. It's crazy. I'm from, from India. The East India Company was In the, the face of such ferocious criticism, leading members of the Anti-Slavery Society felt compelled to support a more gradual approach to the abolition of slavery. This involved accepting measured steps towards the ultimate goal of emancipation and concessions made to the West India lobby. Now, as we'll soon discuss, this became extremely controversial within the organisation. But Buxton and Wilberforce, conscious of the backlash they had received after the 1816 rebellion in Barbados and the anger and hatred they had already been faced with in Parliament, opted to take what they thought was required, a pragmatic approach. And that they did. Wilberforce made clear at the end of his appeal that those in the anti-slavery society should err on the side of caution. Before I conclude, may I presume to interpose a word of caution to my fellow labourers in this great cause? A caution which I can truly say I have ever wished myself to keep in remembrance and observe in practice. It is that while we expose and condemn the evils of the system itself, we should treat with candour and tenderness the characters of the West Indian proprietors. So often, enslaved people themselves are left out of this conversation. If they feature, it's as an example that's being used by abolitionists, or sometimes by slaveholders, to try to prove their point. Um, but no one really asked enslaved people themselves 
uh, within this debate, abolitionists or government or slaveholders, about their, their position within all of this. So someone like Wilberforce, I think, very often talks about this with a discussion that includes enslaved people really only in the abstract and that sometimes ref references the, the planters, you know, he's thinking about, well, what's the impact of this going to be on the planters? Will they go along with this? Um, how, how will this impact on them? Can they make a good, um, uh, a good go of, of whatever comes out? That's quite informative, I think. It tells you something about the abolitionist mindset when you look at other sources about governments perspective on on this and and planters certainly were a really important part of the consideration of abolitionists and of government through this whole process wow but in a way he had to talk like that initially this approach provided a speck of light at the end of the tunnel after months of lobbying in parliament for gradual emancipation Buxton had managed to convince the Foreign Secretary, Lord Canning, who was the face and heart of the British government at the time, to propose a set of ameliorative measures to improve the conditions of slaves in the West Indian colonies. This house looks forward, Canning stated, to a progressive improvement in the character of the slave population. He even urged MPs to vote for the accomplishment of this purpose at the earliest period. This all looked great on paper to Buxton, but he was in for a rude awakening. So the, the resolutions that government pass in 1823 are presented as a response to the abolitionists and uh, as a, a sign really of government's goodwill of wanting to improve conditions on the plantations with the notion that this will lead eventually, and that's never really disclosed as to how long this whole process might take, lead eventually to an end to slavery. That's the long-term professed aspiration for this. Some abolitionists, of course, are furious about this. And of course, enslaved people in the Caribbean, you can imagine what their frustration must have been. Because essentially what this is doing is saying, well, we'll take it one step at a time, very gradually and very slowly. Buxton's blood boiled once he had realized he had fallen straight into Canning's trap. His resolutions, which realistically postponed any chance of reform in the colonies. After an anti-slavery society meeting here at the Truman Brewery in Spitalfields, Buxton cursed at the legislation to such a degree that those closest to him began to challenge his Quaker descent. For pragmatists like Buxton, it became increasingly testing to continue to endorse the gradualist approach. He still, however, was uncertain that any other strategy would achieve colonial reform. What he could be sure of was that the offer of a gradualist approach had angered many who supported the anti-slavery society and polarised the organisation. Spearheaded by younger female campaigners such as the social reformer from Leicester, Elizabeth Hayrick, a more radical section emerged. Hayrick, in a widely read pamphlet published a year after the calculated and ineffectual resolutions of amelioration proposed by Lord Canning, called for immediate as opposed to gradual abolition. So those with a real pressing interest and concern, of course enslaved people are the most obvious group with that pressing interest and concern in ending slavery straight away, find that kind of approach extremely frustrating. But so too do many abolitionists in Britain. Elizabeth Hayrick is the most famous example of a Quaker abolitionist in her case, who argues very stridently for immediate, not gradual emancipation. And what she's arguing against is this gradual abolitionist campaign, but also this gradualism within the Tory government of the 1820s that uh, meets the abolitionists halfway and makes these, these really fairly conservative um, moves, gestures towards uh, amelioration and improvement that aren't going to end slavery anytime soon. Hayrick's displeasure at the gradualist approach was accompanied by a mass public campaign 
led by figures such as Joseph Sturge and George Stephen, the younger son of the famous abolitionist campaigner James Stephen. They had gone back to their roots, tactics that had worked so well for them in their fight to see the slave trade abolished. Petitions were signed by hundreds of thousands of people, sugar boycotts were organised, and yet again, public pressure was applied to those in government. It was at this point that we see a change in momentum. There was now a popular campaign, there were sugar boycotts and there were petitions being signed. And even those who had previously advocated the gradualist approach were starting to change their tune. Abolitionists had paid their opposition far too much respect. They had attempted to empathize with the West India interest and it had come back to bite them. It was now time to take the initiative. Yet members of the anti-slavery society were still missing something. They had the evidence and popular support, but this was not nearly enough to sway votes in favour of an Emancipation Bill. You see, up until this point, there are a few things that made the West India interest such a formidable force. Number one, they had the strength in numbers in the form of MPs in both houses. Number two, the products of slave labour were still enjoyed by the masses in Europe and brought in vast quantities of wealth to the metropole. And number three, many people truly empathised with the planter class, believing them to be honest capitalists who treated their slave labourers with care, or at least certainly a lot better than the poor labourers in Britain. Yet it would take little over a decade from the time at which the anti-slavery society was formed for every single one of these pillars to crumble to the ground. All right, there's a, a part two of this. We'll be watching that, but uh, I'm going to do the part two in two because uh, I think it's like 51 minutes long. So I'll, I'll break it up and break it down in half or something like that. But this is quite interesting. It's, it's amazing when, we, when we, we look at these historical events and if we look at it from a political perspective, how the same sort of tactics is being used for the working class today, which I guarantee you without their, and, and, and that's from a political perspective. We're not even talking about the, the, the actual conditions of the slaves, uh, which they probably use on the, their own people without the, the harsh conditions on slaves that the slaves had. And we're repeating it. We're repeating it. But uh, I hope you guys uh, kind of learned something here from watching this with me. If you guys enjoyed it. If you did, drop a like on the video. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that, you know, you'll know when I'm putting out new videos. I mean, I put out regularly, you know. It's usually Sunday through Thursday that I put out a video. So you all, you know, keep watching. I'm going to leave links to other uh, videos on slavery somewhere on the screen here keep watching to see what the reaction is you all take care of each other all right cool runnings